is a good point to take a break and take some questions. Uh, I'll go with live questions now, and then I'll look at chat. Okay, uh, L R Tiwari, Mira Road. Please go ahead. Okay, sir. Uh, uh, you you spoke about the research methodology. Uh, why do we need to have a search? This is the basic question I have. Well, research and search are two different things. Uh, research is the uh, the goal is to uh, find something new, and you know we saw uh, the Oxford definition of research. There must be something novel here. Search is something different. If you uh, mean uh, web search, uh, that's a different thing. Now, whenever you do research, you have to see what other people have done first, because you don't want to reinvent the wheel. <laughs> if you uh, come up with something which somebody has already done, that's not novel. So the first part is understanding what other people have done, uh, how far they have reached, and what are the gaps. And then you go around uh, finding gaps and filling them. That's a major part of research. Sometimes research can be totally uh, different in the sense when the web came up. The web was not exactly a research project. It was a development project which was uh, done in CERN. And it was a tool that was built to help uh, physicists working on shared projects. Uh, but then it exploded, its uh, possibilities were amazing, and what was uh, initially just a tool exploded into something much bigger than anyone had thought about, and then there were so many research issues which came up. How to uh, do uh, you know, web search, how do you type a few keywords and find things, information that you are looking for. Uh, information retrieval is an old area, uh, but it exploded when the web exploded. Uh, so, uh, you know. You can have research uh, where there is a real life problem, you don't know how to do it, and you figure out how to do it. That is certainly part of research. Uh, so that's one of the two modes I had talked about. That's one mode. The second mode is when uh, you look at what others have done and try to improve on what they have done. Uh, I hope that answered your question. Let's move on to, at this point, to questions related to storage. We have one more session on research, so I'll answer more questions on research tomorrow evening. We have Xavier's Catholic College, Tamil Nadu. Sir, uh, actually uh, you explained about uh, the RAID system. Yeah. Yes, and you said uh, multiple disks are used in parallel. Yeah. So what should be the capacity of this individual disk that we should use? Should it all be of same size or different they can be? Uh, what should the capacity of the individual disk be? Is that the question? Yes, yes sir, for RAID system. So uh, the capacity of individual disks depends on um, the cost of the disk, the reliability of disks, and so on. Uh, so what happens is uh, typically the newest disks of highest capacity tend to be a little more expensive. So if you look at the price per gigabyte of a 3 terabyte disk today, it's higher than uh, that of a, a 1 terabyte disk. Uh, so depending on how much storage you need, your minimum RAID system might support uh, maybe 6 to 8 disks. So if you need uh, 3 terabytes of usable capacity, uh, you might put in 6 1 terabyte disks and uh, put it in RAID 1. Or if your data is cold, you might put in uh, maybe 4 1 terabyte disks with one of them acting as parity disk. Uh, and then your cost comes down. Uh, your uh, write performance may come down, but if your data is mostly videos which somebody is downloading, you are reading but not writing that often, this is perfectly good. Uh, so th that depends on what your application is. Um, so the disk capacity which you choose again depends on that. It's more an economic choice than a, a you know a choice which is based on technology. So today, if I want more capacity from the same box, I don't want to buy a new box. I might buy a three terabyte disk, pay a little bit more, but avoid the cost of one more box. Uh, do you have any follow up? And on the same uh, topic, uh, hmm. so what should be the physical arrangement that we should make if we want to have multiple disks in the RAID scheme, sir? Actually, uh, should it all be of hard disk? Actually, what is the real physical arrangement on this? Right. So typically, how you build a RAID system, if you uh, buy a server box, that server box has space for a number of disks. Typically, you would put disks of exactly the same type and size uh, so that 
the performance is uniform. You don't want to mix uh, some slow disk with some hard disk, some disk of higher capacity with some disk of lower capacity. You don't want to do that. You would pick identical disks and put them in an, uh, into the system. Now the system will, uh, you know, the RAID software or the RAID hardware, you can buy a hardware card which supports RAID uh, or you could do it in software. Uh, software RAID is acceptable for many applications, but not for, uh, you know, critical databases. Because there is a small chance of data, uh, some updates being lost. So if you are a bank database, you would definitely not trust it to software RAID. Uh, but if you have uh, some student data which once in a way, if you lose, it's not the end of the world. Uh, you might be happy with software RAID. And uh, whichever one you use, those six or eight disks which you put in are organized in whatever form, RAID 1, RAID 5, as appropriate, according to your choice. So the RAID systems will allow you to configure it. So they let you choose what RAID type you want, how many disks, and so forth. Any further questions? Thank you, sir. Good morning. We have uh, Bannari Amman, Satya Mangalam. Please go uh, ahead. Uh, good morning, sir. So, what are the difficulties we could face while sustaining relationship among relations in a complex database, sir? Uh, relationships amongst relationships in a complex way. I'm not sure uh, what you mean by that. Database. Uh, hmm? What? Sir, the, while uh, creating relationship, uh, relations in a complex database. What is the question? What is the issue? What are the difficulties we will be facing? Um, so a question like this is very loosely phrased. You know, it's like what are the difficulties we will be facing? This is a rather loose question in the sense that, uh, you know, uh, I can tell you that if you are a programmer, you will have difficulty doing joins and things like that. But that is not the point. Why did you come up with that? particular schema. It was driven by a design process uh, which helped you choose that schema. And uh, if that uh, schema was complex, well, it is complex. And uh, you know, that is what you needed. That is the kind of data you wanted to store. If it is complex, it is complex. That is life. And then if you have to uh, do joins, that is life. Now if you find performance problems because of that and you want to deal with that, there are ways around it. Uh, there are ways to use, create materialized views and so forth, uh, which can speed up performance in some cases. And there are indices you can create which can speed up performance. Uh, but uh, it's not driven by uh, you know uh, you know what are the difficulties that that the difficulties you have to quantify. What are the performance issues? What are the uh, overheads on programmers and stuff like that? You have to break it up into pieces and address these individually. Any follow-up questions? Thank you, sir. Okay. Jawaharlal uh, Institute of Technology, Madhya Pradesh. Sir, there are some uh, other parameters for measuring the performance of a disk, uh, excluding seek time, average time. Can we measure the uh, performance? Uh, so the uh, ones which I have given you are fairly comprehensive. Uh, there is uh, seek time, access time, that's rotational latency and ac uh, together access time. Then there is the transfer rate for reads and for writes. And then there is mean time to failure. Those are the primary um, uh, metrics for measuring the performance of a disk. Uh, I'm not aware of any other major ones. There may be some other uh, less important metrics, but these are the major ones. Information storage management is a part of database. Uh, what do you mean by information storage management? Uh, database is storing data. Uh, how, how are you differentiating data from information? Uh, you know, that is something which is up to a higher level. But at the physical level, data is data. Whether data is a record or it is a document or it is an image, uh, that makes a difference on whether you store it in a database or in a file system. Uh, so that is a primary distinction. Uh, good morning, sir. Uh, sir, what is the basic difference between NAND flash and NOR flash? Uh, so there is a technological uh, difference between it. I mean, any of us who is familiar with uh, hardware knows about uh, NAND and NOR gates. Um, but 
that is not the key thing here, it is not the NAND gates are very different from NOR gates, it is just a terminology. And the primary difference between these two is that NOR flash uh, is used to uh, store data in a way which is byte address. So, it looks more or less like regular memory, you can read, uh, you know, you can give an address and read it very fast. Um, and this is used to store uh, like ROM, a read only memory uh, is often stored in uh, NOR flash. Uh, so, you can actually execute a program by reading directly off NOR flash, it is possible. Uh, so, some bootloaders and so on may be stored in NOR flash. On the other hand, uh, the byte addressability means that the per uh, byte cost goes up. So, if you want to reduce the uh, per byte cost of uh, flash storage, you use this alternative uh, which is called NAND flash. Again, uh, do not worry about the uh, issue of NAND gate versus NOR gate, it is just uh, think of it as terminology, maybe NAND gates are used. but uh, the key thing here is that uh, it is not byte addressable, so you can pack the thing very densely in a chip. You can store a lot more data uh, in a particular number of gates uh, with the NAND uh, flash technology than with NOR flash. So, that is what is used for pen drive solid state devices. Okay, we have Ohm Institute, uh, Hisar. Please go ahead. Uh, here is Surender Singh from OITM Hisar Haryana. My question is that what is the difference between uh, server based RAID and controller based RAID? Uh, server based versus controller. I repeat. So, uh, I think uh, what yes, you are referring to is what is also known as software versus hardware RAID. So, controller based RAID means there is a specific controller uh, which is the RAID controller. Uh, which uh, implements the RAID subsystem and uh, server based uh, which uh, I think is uh, the same as software RAID, I am not 100% uh, sure about whether this is the same thing, but uh, I think it probably means the same thing. So, in software RAID you have uh, programs which run in your computer which manage the RAID system. So, the computer knows there are uh, two disks and when you want to write to one disk, it will also write to the other disk. So, you can uh, set up your uh, OS to recognize that uh, these two disks should be treated as one unit for read. So, uh, you might think that both of these would do the same thing, but the key difference is that any good hardware read system uh, would have a bit of non-volatile RAM to record in progress writes. Uh, why is this important? It is important because if there is a failure in the middle of the write, uh, the RAID system may be left in an inconsistent state. So, if there is a power failure in the middle of a write, if the system crashes in the middle of a write, you could land up in uh, trouble. So, the hard, good hardware RAIDs, again uh, people say hardware RAID and when you look closer, it is a card, but it does not have non-volatile RAM. So, I would not really count them as proper hardware RAIDs. So, uh, a proper hardware RAID would have this non-volatile RAM. So, that if there is a failure in the middle, you can recover from that failure. So, uh, if you have important data, you should go with hardware RAID. On the other hand, hardware RAID systems also cost money. So, uh, most of our computer systems which do not have such critical data, uh, you know, the last few updates, you know, if you lose it, fine, you are not going to lose sleep over it. Uh, so, for all such computer systems, we uh, tend to have uh, software RAID. Uh, so, most of our computers in uh, the CS department here run hardware RAID because that is uh, sorry run software RAID because it is cheaper and good enough for us. Uh, now, if you buy a, you know Intel BIOSes, many of them uh, support RAID on the uh, in the as part of the BIOS itself. Uh, now, you might think these are hardware RAID, but the at least the cheap boards do not really have non-volatile RAM and what they are doing is what the OS would have done just write to both copies if there is a failure well tough luck. So, you do not get the benefits of non-volatile RAM with the cheap cards. So, okay, let us get back to the slides now. Okay, where we left off uh, before taking questions, we uh, uh, saw this uh, slotted page structure which lets us store variable length records in a page. Now, how do you uh, decide which record goes where in a file? So, there are various organizations. In a heap organization, a record can be placed anywhere in the file where there is free space. So, when a record comes in, it is stored at any location in the file where there is free space. 
a common thing is to just keep sequentially adding at the end of the file. And once the record goes there, it stays there forever. That is a heap organization. Well, forever meaning until there is a physical reorganization done. Sequential on the other hand stores records in sequential order, sorted based on some particular key. Uh, so, you choose a key and store it sorted on that thing. Now, the original uh, sequential files would uh, let you do this sorting initially b when you uh, create a particular uh, relation file, whatever records are there are sorted. But if you start inserting, updating, deleting records over a period of time, the uh, sorting will uh, tend to get spoiled, and then you have to reorganize the file once in a while to bring it back to real sorted order. The last option is hashing, where you compute some hash function on uh, one or more attributes of the record, and that hash function tells you where the record should go. Uh, these were uh, supported, in fact, Oracle I think still supports hashing, uh, but it is no longer encouraged as much um, for reasons we will see later. Uh, finally, uh, there is a data dictionary storage, uh, which is the also called the system catalog, which stores all the metadata. So, this is very important because you know we have stored data on a uh, disk. If I want to read data from a relation, how do I know where in disk this data is? And that information is part of the data dictionary. And the data dictionary has several pieces of information. The first is uh, the names of uh, relations, including uh, the names, and types, and lengths of attributes of each relation. Then you have names and definitions of views. You have integrity constraints. So these are all logical information about relation. Uh, other logical information includes who are the users, what are their passwords, and then the statistical data which is used for query optimization, such as how many tuples are there in each relation, uh, what is the distribution of values, how many distinct values are there, and so forth. And the next part is the physical file organization information, which is very important. How is each relation stored? Sequential, hash, heap, whatever. Uh, where is this? Uh, relation physically. Now, what do I mean by this? Uh, if the data is stored as operating system files, this is simply the names of the files containing the data about that relation. If it is stored directly on disk, then this would have to include disk blocks which store data for that particular relation. Uh, then there is information about indices, which is the next topic, and so forth. Now, all of this information uh, can be stored as relations themselves. So, this is a schema diagram showing the uh, metadata which we saw in the last slide organized as a schema itself. So, you have relation metadata with primary key being relation name, it has number of attributes, storage organization, location. Then you have attribute metadata whose primary key is relation name and attribute name, and for each attribute type, the position within the record, the length if it is fixed length, or maximum length if it is variable length. Uh, then you have index metadata, view metadata, user metadata, and so forth. Now, note here that view metadata, I do not have a foreign key to relations, meaning I am not tracking which relations are used in the view. Uh, if I did, the schema diagram would be a little different, uh, but then uh, people are asking me, what happens to a view if an underlying relation is deleted? Uh, it would be detected if you had an appropriate schema here. And the last topic for this chapter is uh, storage access. So far we have said how to store data, but how do you access that data? And the way most uh, database systems do it is you do not go and read the data from disk every single time you need it. Instead, a data which has been brought from disk is stored in a part of memory called the uh, database buffer. So when you want to read data, you first check if that particular piece of data is already in the buffer. Maybe somebody else read it and it is there in the buffer. If so, you read it from the buffer. If it is not currently in the buffer, then you read it from disk into the buffer, which of course means if somebody else has uh, already filled the buffer, some other data has filled the buffer, you have to evict some data from the buffer. So, operating systems do this too as part of the file system buffer. Uh, it is hidden from you. And database systems do it for the uh, database uh, buffer. Now, how do you manage space in the buffer? Whenever space is needed for a block which needs to be read in, you have to evict something. 
and there are several different buffer replacement policies. Now, operating systems typically use least recently used or variants of LRU, approximations of LRU. Uh, in operating systems, the idea is that a block which is recently accessed is likely to be accessed again in the near future. Uh, operating systems usually can't do much better. Actually, they can these days. There is some hacks on top of that. Uh, but by and large, they don't know what the application program is doing. Uh, so they can't really do more. But a database system knows exactly what is going on. If you're running a query, the database system knows what the query is. They know what data that query is going to access. They know this query is going to read every single uh, block of this uh, 10 gigabyte relation. If you use LRU, uh, you, know, you read the first block, you're reading the relation sequentially. You're not going to read that first block ever again till you finish reading the whole relation. So LRU turns out to be a very, very bad idea for a relation scan. In fact, what it does is when you have large relation scans, it evicts all the useful data and keeps a whole lot of useless data in the buffer. So database systems tend not to use LRU naively, uh, but to use alternatives. Mm. So what they do is, uh, first, while a block is being used, it is pinned or fixed in memory. Okay, so we have been hearing a lot about spot fixing. Uh, so I couldn't wait till we got to this slide uh, on uh, pinning or fixing data in the buffer, uh, which has a completely different meaning. It's fixed in buffer. It cannot move out. Uh, so while you're accessing a block, it has to be pinned. And when you're done reading data from that block, you can unpin it. In this period, it cannot be removed from the buffer. Now, among those things which are not pinned, you have multiple replacement policies. If you're doing a relation scan, uh, one block after another, as soon as you're done with the block, you might as well throw away that block because you're not going to look at it again. Uh, so for whatever block was fetched for the scan, can be tossed immediately. Of course, if that block was already there because it was being used for something else, maybe you don't want to apply toss immediate as is. Uh, toss immediate is uh, closely linked to most recently used, which says that uh, the system must pin the current block, and uh, as soon as you're done with it, you throw it out. It's basically the same thing, it's just another name. There's some minor differences. And lastly, some pieces of the database are very highly frequently accessed. Uh, these include the data dictionary itself. So what most systems will do is um, keep the data dictionary blocks in a main memory buffer, or they may even read the data from those blocks and create in-memory data structures, which are more efficient. And then these blocks can be thrown out. And finally, buffer managers also support forced output of blocks, meaning you can tell the buffer manager, I have updated this block. Now, please write it out to disk. I need it so that if there's a failure after this, the data is safe on disk. Okay, I'll take a few questions related to storage. <coughs> D.Y. Patil, Kolhapur. Yeah. My question is, uh, we have been talking about data storages, and uh, the question is, uh, the recently the new field in data storage or uh, data retrieval is coming on, that is digital forensic investigation. So, sir, please would you throw some light on digital forensic investigation. Okay. So uh, digital forensics uh, at the level of data storage, there's many aspects to digital forensics. But the idea is that uh, people may have uh, stored files on their hard disk and maybe they deleted them subsequently. Uh, but you still want to find out what they had stored because it's very easy to delete data from a hard disk apparently. You say, uh, you know, delete uh, or remove or depending on the OS you're using. But it turns out that uh, when you delete data from a disk using uh, whatever OS command, that actually just delinks all the blocks from the directory structure. The actual blocks are not overwritten at that point. So the original data which you had there are there on the underlying blocks. The only catch is that you don't know which blocks are relevant, which blocks were in your file. Uh, so there are, uh, you know, some hacks which can help you partially recover uh, files even though you have deleted them. And uh, that is important if there has, uh, you know, you're looking at a particular hard disk for evidence of uh, some criminal activity which the person has deleted, maybe by, uh, you know, applying these uh, techniques, 
you can uh, find out that uh, you know this file was there it was deleted it was unlinked but by scanning the hard disk i you know find that what looks like part of the free space was actually the header of a file from that i can find the other blocks of the file some of them may have been overwritten but at least i can find parts of the file and uh, determine what had been stored there. So, this is part of digital uh, forensics for storage. Uh, that is not a topic we are covering here, it is a very specialized topic, most people will never get to it. However, the relevant part is if you are, uh, if you really want to cover your trail, uh, it is not enough to just uh, remove the file and uh, you are not done. The other part of it is, if you have stored uh, passwords on your uh, machine and your hard disk uh, apparently fails, has some problem, you give the hard disk away to a vendor, well if uh, you are a high value target, uh, they might, uh, somebody might be able to put some effort and recover stuff which you had on your hard disk and maybe access your bank account. Uh, so, those are uh, some risks which people should be aware of when disposing of hard disk. In particular, uh, if you are disposing of hard disk from your uh, college uh, or home with uh, some important information, you should be careful. Any other question for me? So, I have one more follow up question. Uh, I would also like to know some uh, research avenues if there are any in, in this field that is digital forensic investigation. Okay. Uh, research avenues in digital forensics. Now, I am not aware of uh, work in this field, this is not an area I have looked at, so I am not able to guide you on it. Mm, so, uh, I am afraid I have to leave it at that, but I will tell you some work in the database area which uh, is there. You can go read it up. Uh, there has been some work on how to clean up data thoroughly in such a way that there is no trail left behind. So, which is the opposite problem. Uh, it is to help you uh, clean all traces of what you have done. The converse problem is given that somebody has not done such cleaning, can you recover data which was deleted. So, I am not aware of work on the recovery of data, which is probably a very important problem, even more than cleaning up. The only thing is that the recovery tends to be kind of specific to uh, specific databases, specific data structures and so forth. So, you have to understand those details in order to do any of it. So, uh, when it goes down to very specifics, uh, you know, it is a little harder uh, to uh, do this without some intricate knowledge of the storage structures. Uh, so, you have to be prepared to get your hands dirty and understand stuff at a very low level. Um, but yes, I think th there are some avenues for doing it both at the level of files in the file system and uh, also uh, storage in a database because uh, databases have tuples which have uh, you know slotted page structure. So, on the things which we studied, you should be aware of it. Uh, uh, so, if you deleted a record in a slotted page structure, if the other records in that page got moved then there is no hope of, uh, to override the gap that it created, there is no hope of recovering it. Uh, but if something else happened, then maybe you can still recover it. So, many databases are multi-version data, meaning they keep old versions of data around for some time. So, even after you have deleted it, you can recover it from the old version. So, there are some issues at the database level in how to uh, recover data that has been deleted. Uh, we have uh, Sushila Danchan Ghodavat. Hello, good morning, sir. Uh, sir, my question is why RAID is so important for database and how to decide which RAID is suitable for which database? Yeah, you do not pronounce it as RAID, RAID. So, why is RAID important? RAID is very important because this do fail. Uh, we have a uh, cluster of 40 machines uh, in our basement which we use for uh, my colleague uh, set it up. Uh, and so, those 40 machines have I think about 120 plus disks and uh, pretty much every month uh, one or more disks fails out of that 120. Now, if we did not have RAID, we would lose data every month and if you lose data recovering it, uh, you know setting up the OS again is a big headache, it is a lot of manual work. You really cannot afford this kind of data loss in pretty much any setting today. So, RAID is uh, the most widely used thing to prevent data loss when a disk fail. It is a given the disk will fail, so you have to have RAID. Now, the choice is between different RAID types of performance. Uh, there is another uh, kind of choice which uh, is actually relevant in the context of uh, 
file system that spans many computers. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about it in the context of big data, but um, even before that, uh, it's worth mentioning that there are uh, distributed file systems that offer distributed read. What that means is it's not that um, a copy of the disk is made, but any file uh, block which you keep, they will keep it in more than one location. So if a disk fails in the overall uh, distributed file system, uh, they can still recover the data without having a one-to-one -one mapping. It's, it's not like uh, hardware or the RAID at the level at which we saw it, but a similar concepts applied at a different level. So does that answer your question? So that, that's an active area. Sir, one more question related to attributes. Hmm. How to implement the uh, simple attribute, composite attribute, derived attribute in SQL? Uh, so we saw how to uh, take an ER diagram with these types of attributes and convert it to the normal, first normal form, flatten it out. Uh, so that's pretty much what you would have to do. Uh, there are some rare cases where you could use the uh, object relational features of a database like PostgreSQL or Oracle, uh, which lets you store fields which are uh, multi-valued. Uh, but that would be more the exception. You, sh you should not do that as a matter of course. Yes, sir. Yes. Hmm. Um. Sir, so my question was with respect to discrete performances. Uh, in Linux, we can increase our discrete performance with the help of block DEV command, that is blocking of I.O. controls. So how this can be done with uh, respect to Windows other than uh, the options for disk fragmentations? Uh, I'm not familiar with Windows at this level, so I'm unable to answer your question. Uh, so the optimizations uh, in the Linux context so uh, by default, the Linux uh, file systems uh, do a variety of things. So when you read a file, uh, they are supposed to keep track of the access time. Uh, when was the last time the file was accessed? Uh, which actually has a very big overhead in some cases. If you're doing a lot of reads, uh, that turns into a lot of updates of the access times of the files. So one of the optimizations which is available is to turn it off for a particular file system. So access times are not tracked. And that's very useful in many cases because we don't care about access times. When was the last time you used the access time for a file? Um, whereas the update time is something which is very important. Uh, there are a few other parameters like this which you can tune to improve the performance of a file system. Uh, the Windows equivalents of it I am not familiar with, so I'm unable to answer that part of the question. Okay. Purnima College, Rajasthan, please go. Sir, my question is how relational databases are stored on disks? Uh, in other words, how multiple relations are mapped into disk files and is there a separate file for each relation of a particular database or multiple relations are stored in a single disk file? Okay, okay that's a good question. So uh, I showed an abbreviated version of uh, chapter 10 slides. If you see the full version of the slide or if you go to the book for that matter, there is some discussion of this issue. So uh, restricting ourselves to uh, systems which store data as OS files, the most common situation is that uh, there is one or more files per relation, but uh, two relations cannot share space in a single file. That is the most common uh, kind of setting. Uh, so if you have uh, one relation, it may have 20 files, another relation may have one file depending on how big it is. Typically, uh, many of these systems will create a directory and start creating files inside the directory. Uh, as the relation grows, they will create extra files. Now, uh, the other uh, part of the question is, uh, can you have multiple relations stored in a single file? Uh, logically, yes, and practically, some databases allow it. I think Oracle allows this. It's called multi-table uh, clustering. Uh, so if you have two relations which tend to get access together, it's actually more efficient to store the tuples of those two relations clustered together in the same page. Uh, so supposing I have, um, uh, let's say, a student and the courses that the student has registered for, and these are accessed very frequently together, uh, may, maybe the transcripts. Courses registered for is slightly different. But let's say a student and their transcripts. Uh, so these are very often accessed together. So it may make sense to store a student tuple with the transcript tuple in the same page. Um, so this is supported by some database systems. 
there are uh, trade offs, it will help certain queries, on the other hand it hurts certain other queries, we just want lists of students without getting their transcripts. So, they pay a higher IO cost, so there is a trade off. So, that is the end of this chapter.